Simon from Narantz. Uh, today I'm joined by Craig Cushman. He's the Director of Marketing for EMA in the US. Mm -hmm. Craig, thank you very much uh, thank you. for coming out to South Africa. Don't Craig worry. actually came down to do some uh, training with us to show us a little bit more about EMA, how to test it, you know, make us accredit it so that uh, when you guys run into any issues, um, you know, we can come out and, and look at your your vessel and, and test your transducer, and check your health on the transducer, you know, everything based around the actual uh, any MR transducer products. So for any guys with elite FS units, HDS live from the standard P66 up to the 265, they do it all. And uh, yeah, so they came down. So Craig, mm -hmm. thank you very much for that. You're welcome. Um, one thing I want to talk to you about mainly, uh, you spoke about a boundary layer, which, right. is, which we know as the bubble trail that goes sure. underneath the boat. Can you, can you just tell us a bit how the size and, and the length and the type of boat affects that trail and where, you know, what to look for when installing a very expensive transducer uh, onto, absolutely. onto your vessel? Yeah, absolutely. So the boundary layer that we call is the layer of bubbles that travel down the hull uh, as the boat goes through the water. And what's interesting is the longer the boat or the heavier the boat, the thicker that boundary layer becomes. Um, and so it's really, really important to get the face of that transducer past the bubbles. Uh, so you've got that running in the cleanest water or the least aerated water. And that's what's going to give you really good performance. If you have bubbles going over the face of the transducer, uh, even if it's an in-hull, the location where that transducer is, you're either going to lose bottom when you get up on plane, or you're gonna get a lot of noise on your fish finder. And these guys will, take sensitivity and they'll try and adjust for that. It really is, it's just the bubbles coming down the hull of the transducer, uh, of, the, of the face of the transducer. So if we can get the face of the transducer deeper in the water, you will get a, a better picture on your fish finder. So deeper doesn't normally, I mean, for the trans amount transducers, mm -hmm. uh, obviously we're saying deeper into the water to get it past the bubble trail but we're not meaning too deep into the water from the transom side to Cor cause a drag in the water correct you know you want the transducers to skim but it's a fine line between right where yeah. it's dragging and where the actual yeah. the the perfect level is for, Ex for the exactly transducers. yeah and those those airmar brackets have the adjustability and and you could make a run and see how it how yeah. it works and then maybe drop it down just a bit more make another run and see how it works. So you'll find that sweet spot for your hull. And yeah. for the guys in doing a transducer installation, what, what, is, what do they need to look for when installing it onto the transom? Okay. You know, the correct height on the transom, what, what is that perfect line? Is it the, the half of the, the actual the mount of the transducer? Is it the whole transducer sticking out the bolt? Yeah. You know, what do you look for if you don't know what your boundary layer is and how thick that boundary layer sure. is? What, what is a, a happy medium to, to start off with? If you can visually identify water coming off the, the transom of the boat as you're running, yeah. you'll be able to see aerated water versus less aerated water. You want to find that less air water, aerated water location, and that's really where you want to key in on the installation. Mm -hmm. Then when it, when it becomes to the installation itself, it's going to depend, depend on the hull. It's going to depend on the model of, of transducer. But typically what we'll find is we want to make sure that that transducer is oriented so it's shooting straight down when you're on plane, right? And then you want to have it just slightly hanging below the, um, the hull so that its face is in the water, but not getting that aerated water sure. running past it. And that's going to give you the best performance and you might need to adjust it as we mentioned. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Um, we obviously have uh, traditional sonars. That's what we've had all, all along. I mean, Chirp was something that was used in World War II, not something we had access to. Uh, and now we do. Can, can yeah. you just give us maybe a, a comparison between traditional uh, 2D sonar and CHIRP and why we went to CHIRP and why it's better? Absolutely. In 2011, Airmar brought CHIRP to the recreational market. And really what it does is it gives anglers more bandwidth in the transducer. So if they were used to using a 50 kilohertz transducer, let's say, a CHIRP transducer is going to have between 42 and 65 um, kilohertz of bandwidth so every single one of those 42 43 44 
are going to be different frequencies that you can transmit and receive on. So instead of having one frequency, you might have 25 different frequencies. And that's really important because each one of those frequencies has a different beam width. And they also interrogate fish targets differently. So certain species will reflect different frequencies differently. Yes. Okay, so you may find one particular species really shows up well in certain frequencies. With chirp, it doesn't matter because we can run every frequency that's in the transducer and then the Lorentz unit will compress that return into one picture. Okay. So you can run all of those frequencies. You can send all that energy down into the water and return back and get a really super clear picture on the Lorentz fish finder. So what, what Craig has also mentioned to us uh, in the training is, is traditional 2D sonar on a, on a school of fish might show a blob on the screen. Right. Whereas if you're running chirp with all the multiple frequencies, you're actually separating that ball into individual arches so you can identify specific targets around a bait ball or something like that. So it's a lot more crisp and a lot more clearer. Absolutely. Um, so now you've always got different versions. Um, and as the people know, in South Africa, for us at least, we, we uh, surf launch. So through mm -hmm. hole transducers is not really an option for us. True. Um, so we concentrate mainly on the trans amount and then obviously the in hole transducer. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people, you know, they're very scared either of putting a very expensive transducer on the trans them, scared it's going to break off, which right. we always try and encourage them. It's designed to do that. It's designed to hit the beach. And then you get the other half that don't want to go in hole because they're scared they're going to lose depth capabilities or clarity or quality sure can can you just give us the difference between what how much you actually do lose if you go in all if at all it is true that if there is in that area that you're putting that that transducer in if there's air in the fiberglass it could affect performance but let's just say it's good air free um, fiberglass that you're shooting through you're not going to lose any resolution or any target performance. It's going to be the same as if you're trying you put a trans amount on. What you will lose on an in-hull transducer is about 10% at its deepest deepest depth performance. So if it was 600 meters that this is going to work to you you're going to lose 10%. But if you don't fish that deep to begin with, it's not really a loss that you'll notice. So very, very little concern about going in hull and losing any performance. Again, fish finding performance is exactly the same as a trans amount transducer. So you will never lose, you won't lose the quality of the targets that you're looking for in the Correct. water column. You might, you're just losing that 10% right at the end. Correct. Exactly. Correct. Yep. Um, obviously we, we speak about Lorenz only for us. Um, what, what is the most relevant Lorenz transducer? Let's, let's say one for, for uh, marlin fishing, for the guys yep. that want to go very deep, yep. and then maybe you know, one for the guys that are targeting pelagic species like you know, kuta or tuna or dorado or anything like that. What, what, where, where does it, you know, to what depth do you choose this transducer and what depth do you, you go past and choose a different transducer? Right, in, in chirp transducers, we try and find the right tool for the job or the match the right frequencies with how you fish. And let's take pelagics. If you're interested in pelagics, they are typically in the upper water column over deep water. So really all you care about might be that, that first 150 meters of, of water. Yes. So our high wide beam is going to give the best performance for searching for tuna and maybe marlin in the upper water column. So we would look for something that has a high wide. Um, something like our TM165 would be a great choice or a TM185 high wide. Those are both great choices for that. If someone's looking for deeper performance, that's where the combination units might come in. So you would still have the high wide on a B265 low, I'm sorry, B275 low high wide. Still have the high wide performance, but now you've got low frequencies in there that are going to give you much deeper penetration and much deeper fish finding capabilities. So on, on anglers that are going deep and they want upper water column performance and deep water performance, combination units are the best choice. If all you're worried about is maybe that upper water column, then just pick a single frequency, like a high wide or maybe a medium. 
and match it to how you fish. There is obviously a misconception amongst anglers on, they think they need to track the bottom to see what's in the top 15 right. meters of no. water. And it's, and it's not the case. That's Correct. why we have a manual mode and we can set the range to ping that transducer to. Um, so it's not always necessary for you guys to have a transducer that can read a thousand meters. Right. Although you fish in a thousand meters, you only want to concentrate on that top 100, 200 meters of water because you're not going to raise a fish from deeper than three or 400 meters to come to the top in any way. So it's just concentrate on what you're actually looking for, you know, where, where the, the column that you're fishing in and you'll be good to go. Mm -hmm. um, you spoke a lot, you spoke to us a bit about in training about looking after the transducer, overheating the transducer, sure. specifically with chirp. Correct. Um, what, is, what is the time limit? I mean, obviously it's, 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 uh, it's temperature related. Sure. I mean, for the guys in Durban fishing off Sodwana, going up, you know, up into Mozambique, it gets really, really hot, you know, in the high 30s, 40s sometimes. Um, and running your transducer out the water, you know, some guys say you can do it for a couple of minutes if you want to transfer, transfer your waypoints or something, but it's actually not a good idea. Um, what is that time limit in extreme heat like we would experience in yeah. Durban and, and in Upper North Coast? There's, there's not necessarily one time, limit, time number I can tell you. Yeah. It's all heat related. So if it's very, very hot and let's say your trailer boat is parked in a parking lot or a driveway or something that's that's also uh creating heat it, it, it could be minutes it, it could be 10 minutes 20 minutes something like that we monitor the the ceramic temperature or the internal ceramic of our transducers and anything that goes over 50 c could do damage to that ceramic it could break that ceramic so you it, whenever you can you want to turn off that fish finder or turn off that transducer if you're going to be washing your boat or um, if you forget it. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully you don't forget it. But uh, err on the side of caution and the less amount of time that you have it creating heat or sitting in the heat, the better. Okay, so for you guys with the Lorance, um, you know, you've got that stop sonar button. Uh, you stop that sonar, it's not pinging to the transducer, the transducer is safe and you can navigate and do with your waypoints and do what you need to do on the boat. I like the guy, I know the guys like listening to their music through their sonic hubs, so uh, on the way to the beach or, or on the way back. Um, what, the last question I want to ask you, what is the science to look out for, for a transducer reaching its end of life? Hmm. Yeah, so if, if you had a, a, um, a performance change, let's say, so one particular season you went out and it was running as you expected it or you were accustomed to and then maybe that next season you you saw less or you have led less performance that's where you might want to call one of our certified installers that has a tdt 1000 that would be me <laughs> john and, and and what that that installer can do what john will do is he'll separate the transducer from the electronics and he'll test our transducer to make sure that the performance of that transducer is exactly the way that we uh, designed it to, and and only our tester will do that. And then you'll know is it the transducer that's working well, or maybe we have a, a performance issue on the transducer, or is that issue somewhere else in in the electronics? But that's how you know whether it's the transducer or the electronics it's, itself. And that's usually you'll notice it. You know, target separation, target definition. Sep yeah, or performance at depth that used to work deeper than it does now. And that could be a, a sign of maybe overheating or something yeah. along the way. Or if there's many, many hours on it, it might have come to its end, end of life. Thank you very much. Um, guys, I'll obviously be traveling the whole country to all the competitions with my new tester. Um, for you guys that just want to have a look at your transducers when you see us at competitions feel free to come up to us and ask us to come and have a look at the health of your transducer i can tell you exactly how many hours that transducer have run if it's run in any high temperatures to give you an indication that there might be a problem with your transducer and if you don't understand the old transducer we can just guide you through and exactly what to choose and how to choose it but craig thank you very much for coming out all the way we really appreciate it very and welcome. we wish you a very safe trip back home thank you very much Thank you.